This presentation, titled The Future of Auditing, An Auditor's Perspective, comes to us from Catherine Lockyer, the General Manager of Services for the Joint Accreditation System of Australia and New Zealand, JASENS. For the last 26 years, Catherine has been involved primarily in certification and accreditation. With a food industry background, she started her career in certification as an auditor specializing in the food sector. Catherine has been involved in accreditation activities for the past 11 years. Since assuming her current role in 2014, she has been responsible for all accreditation assessment activities JAZANS undertakes worldwide. Catherine is also a member of the Asia Pacific Accreditation Cooperation, APAC, and is currently chair of the APAC Technical Committee for Certification. She still undertakes assessments on occasion and is a lead assessor for management and product certification schemes and inspection bodies and a lead assessor for GHG verification programs. And with that, take it away, Catherine. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to Ex Exemplar Global for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all today. So frequently I get asked, how did you come to be in auditing? And I think back on a career which has expanded more years than I care to think about. So I'll just give you a little bit about my background and how I have had this journey to where I am today. So I started off primarily as a veterinary nurse receptionist when I left school after a very brief stint at university. And then from then moved on to a role as a dental receptionist and really did not like that role. So I harassed, for want of a better word, the local dairy company to see if they had any opportunities going. And that is where my career really started in the area of quality management and leading to certification. So while I was in the dairy industry, I was involved in looking at a, a variety of quality improvement projects, quality control, and was fortunate enough to actually be invited to attend a number of training sessions, which was just wonderful for someone starting out in their career. I then had quality coordinator roles in the health sector as well, and did for a brief time had a stint working in um, fish pathology prior to the birth of my first child and then later on a small period of time was spent as in the quality coordination role within the health sector um, moving on. So while I was actually involved in the dairy industry I had the opportunity to attend numerous training sessions as I previously mentioned and that was at the time when Deming was something that was everybody was talking about and the organization I worked for embraced the Deming philosophies so was able to attend training in country company-wide quality improvement and analytical thinking for managers and was also able to attend a dairy board training course on Duran and quality improvement this in addition to actually obtaining my certificate in quality assurance and HACCP and other areas of training which was available at that time. This unbeknownst to myself was actually going to form the foundation to what I would do later on in life. After the birth of my first child, I actually spent some time at home, then went to actually work for a health organisation as a quality coordinator. And I was actually involved in moving this organisation from what was then known as um, an area health board into what they called a crown health enterprise. And this was quite unusual for me because I had never worked in health before. But what I actually found was the principles around um, quality assurance, and quality improvement was actually um, very easily transferable. So I spent some time actually working within the health sector, working with the hospital, looking at what they were doing, how they were doing it, and really thinking about how can this expand much further. As the, that particular role sort of came to an, an end, because it was really a transitional role, moving that particular area health board to becoming a chi, I started looking around for what else I could do. I had dabbled in internal audits and had been able to utilize some of the things I'd learned through from the training courses, particularly the Deming work. And I thought, well, what can I do? And then I saw this advert for a quality auditor based out of the Wellington office for a certification body. And I thought to myself, shall I apply? No, they won't want me. What do I have to bring to this organisation? I really don't know. 
So I went for an interview, and this was in the early 1990s, and was amazed that they actually offered me a position as a food auditor. At that time, this was very much a male-dominated environment, and it turned out I was only going to be the second woman auditor that actually employed. In fact, it was such a strange occurrence within that organisation. On my first day, when I was being introduced, I was asked if I was a new admin assistant. So it really was the start of, for me anyway, learning about the industry, what was it involved, and really, what did it mean? So this started what has been for me a long career in certification and accreditation and allowed me to see an awful lot of different um, types of industries. I also had an opportunity to expand into other areas. So not only was I able to become an RAB QSA um, auditor for quality food and occupational health and safety, um, I was also able to get involved in another scheme which was being operated in New Zealand at the time, which was um, under the Accident Compensation Corporation as an approved senior auditor. And what we were doing in that scheme was actually going out and looking at organisations within New Zealand who were implementing health and safety and rehabilitation programmes and they were managing these themselves. And there was actually a discount on their insurance premiums with the ACC, depending on the level they achieved. So this also allowed me to see a wider range of organisations to look at. In fact, at one time, I was actually the ACC um, auditor for New Zealand Rugby. And that was quite a thrill to be able to go and talk to the guys and some of them who became quite very famous All Blacks at that time. So we able, were able to look at a lot of different things as we walked around with our different audits. And I remember going home at that time saying to my husband, what an amazing experience. I think I found the job for the rest of my life. Because I had come out of the food industry and that was where I sort of thought I would stay. And now I was going into organisations. I learnt how toothbrushes were made, how plastics were recycled. At one stage, I challenged an organisation about how their documentation and their training programme would actually enable, enable someone to actually run the particular bit of machinery. And they called my bluff and they handed me the documentation and said, you do it. So I stood there and followed the instructions and actually was able to run the piece of machinery, bearing in mind everybody was standing very closely behind me to make sure I didn't make any mistakes. But that was where it showed me the beauty of um, well-constructed documentation and different ways that organisations could capture what they are doing in order to train people. Another organisation I visited, they had very much an immigrant workforce and English was not a first language and their entire quality management system was all in photos and again that had been something I'd never seen before and that challenged myself as an auditor to think about how does this effectively work and how am I going to actually audit this to ensure that things were actually happening as they should have been. Bearing in mind this was in the heydays of 9001 and that which was primarily what we were all auditing to then. And at that time, quality management systems seemed to fill whole bookcases in offices and it's very much different than it was now. Also at this time, I was able to be a member of New Zealand's Injury Prevention Advisory Council and that allowed me to be part of a group of experts chosen from a wide range of industries, looking at how New Zealand as a whole could set the direction for injury prevention moving forward. And that was an amazing experience. And if it hadn't been for the fact that I had cho chosen this path, I would never have been given that opportunity. 
Likewise, with the WSC advisory panel, I was again asked to sit on this panel and we were able to look at um, how industries were performing in relation to their health and safety and also make comment around poor performing organisations in with particular industries and determine whether or not they needed a particular audit by the regulator to look at what was actually happening. So again, it was very wide and varied opportunities within certification, which I was able to become involved in. Like I said, and it doesn't just sit there. So I had, I was able to go into financial organizations, electrical, timber, manufacturing, clothing, and shoe manufacturing. And as I've mentioned before, um, areas such as quarry, quarrying, as well as maintaining my background and knowledge within the food sector, and also expanding that knowledge as different schemes, different standards came into being from the food sector. After a period of time in this area, I needed a little bit of a break. So I decided to go out and do some quality consulting, which I did for a year. And then a gentleman um, rang me up who I knew, who I used to work with at the certification body and said, I'm actually established a small certification body within a large organization. Would you like to come and join us um, part-time as a, an auditor? And I said, well, why not? So I went along and joined this organization. And in that first year, the two of us in, 30, in a 13 week period, audited every dairy company in New Zealand for compliance with the, um, the dairy regulations. Because at that time I was also a product quality auditor approved by um, the regulator. And it was while I was doing this work, I received probably the best bits of advice I ever got as an auditor. And I actually now tell this to people when I'm training them. And that is particularly when you're out in the field, make sure you go into every room in a manufacturing area, not just where people show you or tell you to go, but look behind every door, because that's when you find what's really going on. And I'll expand a little bit more about that later on. Eventually, um, after a number of years with that organisation, I had set up the inspection body programme within the organisation, had managed various groups within it, and I thought, mm, I'm time for a change. And an opportunity came along to work for Jazz Ends. And it was a slightly different opportunity. I was actually employed as assistant manager business development. And that was gave me an opportunity to work with various regulators, looking at what they were wanting to do and talk to them about how accreditation and certification can actually help them moving forward. Sometimes accreditation or certification is not the answer or the solution, but it's actually a way they could use as a tool. So in some areas we were able to say, this is going to be the right thing for you. It will achieve the outcomes you want. And in other cases we were able to say, we can assist you, but there's other ways you can achieve the outcomes you want. So as part of that, I slowly, I then became the manager for domestic accreditation services, looking after what was happening across Australia and New Zealand. And during that time, I was also a, an assessor. Within my first year of joining Jazz Ads, I was able to attend a, almost a foundation meeting on greenhouse gas verification held in Japan. And we were one of five organizations, audit organization worldwide, who were then actually undertaking assessments against a new international standard for greenhouse gas, which is 14065. And so that was a great opportunity to go to Japan, meet with the people from the rest of the world and talk about what was happening in the um, verification validation space in greenhouse gas. The assessments has also taken me to various countries and I've been to China, Australia, the UK, the USA, and I'm now also a peer evaluator for APEC. And coming up in the new year, I'll have an opportunity to go to Mongolia and undertake an evaluation, which is a form of assessment in Mongolia. As I say, I represent um, Jazzans internationally on APEC. And before that, 
PAC, which is Pacific Accreditation Corporation, and also ILAC, which is the International Laboratory Accreditation Corporation, and IPLAC. So we've also been able to do standard development, and we've been on a number of panels for Standards New Zealand, and was part of a working group looking at the introduction of 45,001 initiated by um, Standards New Zealand. Not the actual development or how the adoption of the standard, but actually a group who'd got together to talk about whether it was a viable um, thing to actually introduce into um, New Zealand, which is what's actually happening now. 45,001 is actually being used here. What, we, what I see moving forward and what we're faced with both as assessors and the audit um, industry as a whole is where are we going? It's a changing environment and I've just put a few things down here which we have to consider. We have to actually consider moving from a paper base to an electronic. So in first world countries, very much electronic based systems. However, in some of the emerging economies, systems are still very much paper-based. So as auditors, we need to be able to adapt and look for both paper-based and electronic. And there's still a need for face-to-face -face assessments, but we're also actually doing more and more remote activities where we have a setup like I'm talking today with you and I'm actually able to see someone's systems, their documentation, their processes, by me sitting at my desk and them sitting at their own desk. And being able to use it, um, particularly in areas where organisations only have a very small number of activities occurring. So we're actually able to save costs to them, but also we have to think these days about travelling and both from an occupational health and safety perspective for our auditors, but also the cost of that on the environment, jumping in planes and flying all over the world. JASNs, as well as other areas within, with both regulators and certification, we're also looking at how we can use smart technology. So this is that next step from the remote assessments. So we have a project currently, a pilot project we're launching around the use of such things as Google Glasses and also how we can use drones. And for me, in my role as an audit manager, we would actually be using these sorts of things to see how our assessment teams at the auditors are performing. Again, I can sit in my office, we can have a client sitting wearing them, and I can observe how my team members undertake both opening and closing meetings when they're doing assessments. We can also use it when the sun, for some reason we're unable to go to a country. It's a very volatile world out there and sometimes we just can't go to a country for something happening. So we could actually ask someone in country to actually pop, pop the glasses on, use the technology and allow us to actually view it from afar. There are issues which we're working through in relation to privacy, which we need to be very cognizant of. And those rules change from country to country. So what might be all right for Australia and New Zealand may not be all right for us to use in Asia. So again, we have to really understand how we can use that. And we have to be very aware of whether or not there is the technology available within the countries we're using it to make it work effectively. The actual way we undertake assessments or people undertake audits has changed as well. I'd like to say when I have always done process-based assessments, process-based audits, that's how I was taught. But there are other um, auditors who have very much grown up in the area of being a checklist-based auditor which check, there are a place for checklists. I personally don't use them very often, but there is a place for them, particularly when you're looking at conformance or compliance to criteria. And so the checklist are very much, is this happening? And yes, it is, or no, it isn't. And we do see some of these checklist audits coming through with some of the um, scheme owners. And that is a way of providing them with confidence. What we need to be very aware of though, is the power of actually going in 
walking around a premise, stopping and just standing in the corner and watching what's actually happening. And almost to the point that people in the room forget you're there and then you can actually see what's actually happening. Um, we're also recognizing that in the days when I started, we only had QMS and EMS came in, food safety came in. But to give you an example, Jazz Ants has over 140 schemes which we actually assess against. And those are what the different conformity assessment bodies, the audit agencies are doing. So the process of actually undertaking an audit or an assessment for a 9001 audit is going to be very different to what we might be doing in the areas of venture tourism. So we have a scheme in New Zealand for adventure tourism, and I have people going out and watching auditors um, undertaking activities such as um, canoeing, off-roading, those sort of venture tourist activities, bungee jumping. So how do you actually effectively audit what's actually happening there and those other requirements which come in? We're also looking at areas such as sustainability. And a brand new standard which is coming out very shortly is called 17,029. It's about validation and verification. It's going to have the greenhouse gas standard sit as part of its suite. But it's really going to be looking at the claims that people make around products and services. And that's going to see a whole different type of auditing emerge and the conformity assessment bodies will be doing things differently in that area. I was also speaking recently to someone from one of the big audit, um, financial auditing bodies, and they are moving into different areas of auditing, well away from financial auditing, and, not, and also outside what would be the sustainability type activities they've been involved in. And they themselves are, are teaching and growing a whole different cohort of auditors and some of the skills. But interesting to note, they are still utilizing the five-day auditor course. So I think what we need to think about moving forward is embracing the technology which is coming, seeing what we can actually do with it, recognize that as auditors, we have to be agile of mind. We have to recognize that we need to change and everything's happening so quickly, we need to change with them. And so how are we going to do that? What are we going to do? And I know of some auditors who are just saying, I'm quite happy to do what I'm doing. I don't want to change and do different things. And so maybe moving forward, there may not be such a role for those auditors. And we actually have to think about doing something quite different for them and how they can still add value because they have a wide range of knowledge and skills, which we want to retain that. But I'm also looking at for myself within my own team of attracting different types of people with different backgrounds who have perhaps more business focus or experienced in forensic audit so we can really do things to meet the changing needs of the environment. So as I've said before, opportunities of the future is limitless and I hope you all embrace this and think about how you can do things differently and faster and swifter so we can actually ensure that moving forward that auditing is seen as something dynamic, a really interesting career path for people and something which will be around for many years to come. Thank you. Well, thank you, Catherine Lockyer, for that fine overview of the future of auditing from the auditor's perspective. And that concludes this presentation.